wherever you're at today, know that next year, you can't be doing half of the stuff if you wanna grow. That is one of my favorite questions to ask in the universe of history of questions. If you come to me and you ask me for advice, first question I'm gonna ask you is, what problem are you trying to solve? Your job as a leader is to create a vision big enough for everybody else's dreams and goals to fit inside of. And if you don't do that, your top people, they will bounce. The truth is, is that no matter what that next thing is, you will hit what's called your complexity ceiling. I spent, you know, I'm 43 now, so I spent uh, 26 years building, scaling software companies. I've invested in 100 plus, four of them are billion dollar companies. You know, if anybody's in software, you probably come across my YouTube videos. I started that about seven years ago. It's the largest channel. And I've just like, I used to live in Silicon Valley. I built and exited three software companies. It's just what I know. It's like, I don't know why, but that's just what I know better than most. Okay, so, so there's many different things I can talk with you about. What I, what I want to do, you uh, are a person who easily could have died. You could have went down many bad paths, and you did, and you, you talk pretty openly about that with, with addiction. I talk very openly about my addiction struggles mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. I've read your whole book, you've read my book. Uh, in, in terms of the drive, you know, you, 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 the drive that destroys the entrepreneur from having freedom, from being successful, from re feeling really connected to, to not having a business they love, having a business they hate, and all these things that you've really created a process around that for yourself first, and now you're teaching it to other people. Uh, what are some of the things that, uh, what happened to you that, first off, caused you to be in a pretty destructive place, and what happened that ended up having you shift in, in spite of, you know, luck, in spite of the guy in jail telling you the, 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 the what, not what, the, the, the guard? Brian, yeah, yeah, yeah Brian. The, telling you that, no, you know, you shouldn't be here, and no. giving you motivational words, which you probably said to a lot of other people, like you said, but it's for some reason. thing to do. Yeah, yeah. so. I mean, I, do you want me to share that part of it, or just like in general, like what drives me and how did I kind of fall in love with this? Because like, what I usually, like to that question, I, I, I would talk about like my dark energy, light energy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think anybody that- grew Talk about that, actually, because yeah. I think that's useful. Uh, we talk a lot about that here yeah. in, in Genius Hour. And I mean, this is the thing, is that it, that, you know, prove people wrong, prove my dad wrong, um, prove all the people that ever said I was a piece of shit. Like the people that thought, I grew up and I wasn't allowed to play with any of the other kids in my neighborhood. Like I would literally have to run to the backyard to the woods to go hang out with the neighbors because their parents were like, you're the kid that the police came over and... So, um, yeah, I just grew up just not feeling like I was worth much. So even though I got sober, that didn't go away. Yeah. It was still there. So for a long time, probably a decade, I, would, I was building businesses, trying to be successful, trying to fill that, that void to try to become enough. And, um, and it's a very powerful energy source, right? It's, it's kind of like, you know, it's like a diesel energy source where it's got a lot of torque, it just doesn't burn very clean. And what happened was, um, is when I was 27, you know, almost a decade of building companies, I had two failures right out of the gate. Like, you know, people are like, how'd you have so much success? I just started really young. So it's not that impressive, you know? When you look at the entrepreneurial year, some people are like, oh my gosh. It's like, yeah, but I've been doing this for 26 entrepreneurial years for real, you know? Like, like trying, not side hustle. And um, at 27, I was in a relationship, engaged to a woman, and I came home, and I found her in tears. And she takes the ring off, and she drops it on the counter, and she says, I'm done. And she left. She went to stay with her parents, and this was seven weeks before the wedding. And in that moment, my life just fucking fell apart. Like it was everything I'd been doing up to that point, you know, building the business, trying to be successful, um, just went away. And I had to ask myself, like, why was I doing this? Why was, why was I trying to be successful for a person? And she never, ever, ever asked me for any of it. She never, never once did she's like, you better be successful or I'm gonna leave. She was like, I would love to be in a relationship with somebody that talks to me. And all I knew was, you know, how to outwork and how to hustle, because that's, that's what I did. So she leaves six months before I exit my company, I become a multimillionaire, depressed, 
anxiety attacks, a fucking mental mindset guy. I was like positive mental attitude and all this shit and I'm having anxiety attacks. I have to go see a therapist and he's telling me like, walk around with a rock in your pocket and when you feel the pressure on your chest, squeeze it. And I was just thinking like, how stupid? <laughs> like how, I, how much am I paying you? Now he did give me some good advice. He said you should buy a boat because being in the water is a very therapeutic yeah. thing. Two thumbs up for that suggestion. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I went through this like crazy period where, okay, I had the money, but nobody wanted to, like all my friends were like, you were the worst person. I could go to birthday parties and with my laptop. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm the best friend ever. Because I'm busy, and at least I'm at the party. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there working on contracts and fucking sending emails. Oh, yeah. And I, I justified all of it. You know, my parents were pissed off at me. Because I, do, I don't know if you guys do this, but I answer the phone when they call. And then tell them how busy I am. Mm -hmm. Don't answer the phone. It sounds crazy, but my dad one time screamed at me. He goes, why are you answering then if you're so busy? And I go, I, I, I don't know what you need. And he goes... I'm retired, like I don't need anything. Like, <laughs> just wanna talk to you. So I was like, okay, new rule, don't answer unless I can talk. But um, it was really like after I got through that period, you know, when I was in my late 20s that I moved to San Francisco. And I give a lot of credit to a guy named Naval. Many of you guys would know who he is today, Naval Ravikant. But when I moved to the Valley, Silicon Valley, and met these young early 20, tech luminary entrepreneurs, right? That had built these $100 million companies in five years. I couldn't understand because I was very driven. I don't know about you guys, but like, I can't turn off the fire in my belly. Like I like to build, I'm a creator. But I had to find a way to do it so that I didn't alienate the people in my life. Because that was easy. I could go all in, be obsessed, and just not talk to anybody else and just work. But that wasn't going to lead to me being in a relationship that I think anybody should be in. And um, Naval introduced me to the concept of leverage. And that literally there's only four ways to get leverage. Okay, write these down. You're going to want to write them down. Okay, it's literally, I call them the four master <laughs> skills. The first one is capital, right? So when I look at businesses, the way I help them scale is understanding where their constraint is. So I call this the theory of constraints. It's not even my idea, it's from manufacturing, okay? TOC, theory of constraints. Most businesses are capital constraint and they haven't solved that problem. The second one is code, right? Software, automation, in today's world, AI, mm -hmm. okay? What a freaking, like if AI didn't write that intro, I wouldn't, like I would have been super like, yeah, of course AI wrote that, like it sounds great. So like AI has And it huge, actually didn't. It, did it didn't, no, well, someday. And then um, the third one is content. It's what we're doing right now. Think about content. Think Joe Rogan. Think, you know, writing an SOP, standard operating procedure. Huge leverage. Write it once, 10,000 people follow it. It doesn't cost you one extra second of your time. The fourth C is collaboration. And this is what I talk predominantly in this book about is the idea of working with other people, of using, you know, labor as a concept, dollars to, to buy back your time so that you can work on things that light you up to make you more money. And once I understood that, it was like, now I can push as hard as I want under using, because literally then it's like, I just need to become an expert at these four, four, four points of leverage, four C's. And that was when everything unlocked. That's when I was like, the only thing stopping me now is my creativity to solve a problem. It's not time. Yeah. yeah. So the pain, where do you think, uh, so there was an artist named Peaches that had a song. I met her when I was having dinner with the global director of MTV probably eight years ago in New York and her name was Peaches Singer. She has a song I feel like called, I might know. Yeah. yeah, Fuck the Pain Away okay. is the name of her, of yeah. her song. One of her songs. And so it's like people work the pain away, they gamble the pain away, they do all kinds of things to... So there's this entrepreneurial pain and angst. Mm. Uh, and I, I like the uh, Charles Bukowski, um, the alcoholic poet. He has a, a um, take the, the writer away from the typewriter and all you have left is a sickness which started in writing in the first place. So you take the writer away from work and all you have left is a sickness which got them starting a business or whatever in the first place. So turning your uh, occupation, your career, your profession into a something that you actually really enjoy, not just be one of these I people know. that pontificate that yeah. I, you know, uh, you love what you do and you never work a day in your life. That sounds good, but most people, you know, grind really hard and they don't really love 
what it is they do, and there's parts of it they do and other parts that they can't stand. Uh, I think you've done a masterful job of differentiating and you're willing to pay money to do it. So your whole premise of don't, you know, don't uh, hire to uh, you know, grow your business, hire to buy, buy back, back your time. time. So uh, for one, what is the pain? And then secondly, let's talk about how to remove it, how to eliminate it, uh, because you have a great methodology to do that. Yeah, so most people, when they grow businesses, they'll get to a place where they feel pain. Right, does that all make sense? Like the more you grow, like if I, if I could triple your business tomorrow, some of you guys would say like, whoa, 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 not ready to handle that, right? We all say we want it until it happens and then you're like, son of a, I gotta, I gotta get some shit figured out first. So when, you know, and I learned a long time ago that entrepreneurs will not grow into pain. If I held a knife to your throat and say step forward, you would not do it because your body says, well, that would hurt, so I'm not gonna do it. So a lot of you guys, when you have opportunities to grow, you feel this pain line, I call it, you do one of three things. The first thing is you decide, you know what? This hurt, I'm gonna do what I did last year because I made more money and it was easier, right? We, I call it stalling. The problem with stalling is um, essentially the world isn't stopping to grow. Gross domestic product increases every year, whether you like it or not. The customer's demand of what you deliver year over year, I mean, gosh, it'd be great, you know, Joe, if we could just do what we did 20 years ago and everybody'd be happy, right. doesn't happen. So your customer's needs are gonna grow. And the most importantly, this is one that I, I lean on the most, is your top people, they expect a future. Because here's what I know, your job as a leader is to create a vision big enough for everybody else's dreams and goals to fit inside of. And if you don't do that, your top people, they will bounce. So stalling is not an option. The second one is sabotage. And sabotage is a funny one because most entrepreneurs don't know when they're doing it. But sabotage is essentially dragging your feet replying to an email. It's um, deciding to come into your business and launch a whole new company, a whole new product, knowing that it doesn't have the proper resources to succeed, but in doing that, it's gonna create chaos, and then through that chaos, you're gonna be able to downsize and you can blame it on that thing. Anybody else throw hand grenades in their business? Come on, let's be honest. I throw, every once in a while, it's a good hand grenade, it's a good fun time, right? A little chaos, why not? So, so sabotage is the second one, and the third one is sell, right? It's I heard there's more money in soul. I mean, Joe, you've been doing this so long that you know, you've seen it. You've probably seen people in this room that have gone through transitions because you hear that somebody else is, you know, I'm gonna do AI, I'm gonna do software, I'm gonna do whatever. The, re the truth is, is that no matter what that next thing is, you will hit what's called your complexity ceiling. You will hit the same place you're at today in regards to your ability to deal with chaos, your ability to deal with people, your ability to be creative, and you'll run into the same problem. So it doesn't matter what vehicle it is, you're still bringing you with you to that next thing. So what I encourage people to do is when you feel that pain, to lean into what I call the buyback loop. And the buyback loop is a three-step process because everything in the world is a three-step process, but the three-step process is pretty easy, but what's unique about it is the implementation. The first one is you audit your calendar for time and energy. Okay, so when I look at, and Anne's here, my assistant, you guys will probably read about her in the book, but Anne, raise your hand, she's right there. This is Anne, okay, that's Joe, no, she runs my life. Anytime I feel like there's chaos in my calendar, where I, I feel like I'm being held back, or I can't express myself, Anne and I do a calendar audit. We look at what are you doing, what lights you up, what, where, where do you really drive results from your time? And anything that doesn't pass that filter, it's gotta go. So time and energy audit. The second step is transfer, so ATF. T is transfer. Transfer is how do I get that stuff in my life to somebody else in a way that I can feel comfortable? How many of you guys have a fear of letting go? Just let's be honest, yeah. okay? <laughs> Here's the thing is that wherever you're at today, know that next year you can't be doing half of the stuff if you wanna grow. So whatever you do today, half of it has to be somebody else if you want to give yourself a fighting chance to achieve your goals. It's just the law of the way it works. So learning how to transfer to another person where you can feel in control is really important. I teach this framework called the camcorder method. I do it almost every day. And I literally record myself doing the work and then I hire somebody, they watch the recordings and then they create the standard operating procedures. Some of you guys are such control freaks that you need to create it. Does that make sense? I'm gonna encourage you to let the smart people that are professionally studied in the thing you need them to do, watch them, you do the genius you do, but have them document it, so then that's really cool. And then the fill, and this is where if you don't finish the loop, it's a buyback loop, 
The fill is the most important because without the last step, you don't get the acceleration. And what the fill is, is filling up your calendar, initially with things that make you money. So if you're a logo designer, you should be designing more logos. If you sell whatever, sell more stuff. Once you've got all of the operations of the business not on your plate, then it's becoming more. So the three areas I tell people to invest in, other than relationships obviously, is skills. What, what skills do I not possess that my organization needs? What are the beliefs that I have that are simply not true? The biggest cost or the worst belief to have is one that just simply isn't true. The other day I had an entrepreneur, she believed the more she grew, the more weight she'd put on. That's a real thing. Mm -hmm. I know men that I coach, if they lose the weight, women will make passes at them and they may do something that would jeopardize their marriage. Real talk. Well, how the heck are you supposed to have success if you have a belief that the more successful you are, the, the, that you have pain, right? So beliefs is the second one. And then the third one is your character traits. Discipline, motivation, leadership, communication. Most people don't have the character traits of somebody that's achieving at that level. And to me, that's like, if I buy back my time, then I'm investing. That's why I love investing in coaching and seminars and all that stuff. Because it's, a, it's literally a cheat code. I'd rather pay for the world's best person to come into my life to teach me what they know. It's literally how I build all my companies. I find the agency who's the best at the thing, pay them, come in, teach my team, bring, bring your playbooks, and then I'm good, team, execute. It's literally the fastest thing in the world, but you gotta pay for it. So that's why the buyback loop is just such an efficient way to grow your business. Yeah, yeah, awesome. All right, well, let's get into it. What, what do you mean by buy back your time? Uh, explain, well, let me, let me say it this way because I have some notes here. So you, why do you spend two million a year buying back your time so that you can scroll TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> I love that you saw that. Um, it, it is kind of funny, because like if you know me and you actually like came into my house and watched me, like when I work, I work incredibly efficient, right? I'm not busy. People are like, oh, I'm always busy. It's like, fuck, I don't give, you, if you want to brag about being busy, go ahead, that's just not me. When I work, I'm effective. Like I'm here doing a media tour, I got uh, 13, and how many podcasts? 13 podcasts. People are like, how long are you in town? I want to hang out. It's like, no time, allocated, right? But when I'm not, I'm not. And I don't mind laying on the couch, and just chilling and scrolling TikTok. Getting, and, a, getting a dopamine hit. Yeah, whatever, just yeah. fuck it, like I get it. Like I help people build software like this. I, I understand what's going on neurologically. But I give myself the permission, why? Because when I wake up, I attack the day until I feel drained and when I'm done, that's like, that's like I love reality TV. Like Real Housewives, game on. Me and my wife loves that shit. Selling Sunset, let's go. Like it's weird, but it's just, it's just true. Right? Um, but yeah, I spend probably a couple million dollars on hiring people to run companies, to run my household, to run my life, so that I can do only what I want to do and not what I don't. Not because I'm not willing to do it, because I did it for a long time, it's just because I know that's not a good use of my time. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Well, I, and, and, and so I think everyone- But you gotta spend the money. I just think some of you guys are pretty freaking cheap. Yeah. Like, legit, if you tell me you don't have time and you drive the new Mercedes and you got a big ass house and you fly, you charter private a lot, just saying, you might want to allocate your capital somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. So here, here's, here's uh, what I think. We have Dr. Don Wood who's actually watching uh, on, on Zoom and we were talking earlier today and he has this line, we were talking about it earlier, uh, if you understood the atmospheric conditions of somebody's life it would make sense why they are the way they are. So the way that somebody shows up has a lot to do with it. So upbringing, what they've been exposed to, their own identity, uh, the rationalizations uh, drilled into them to not you know, I mean, a lot of people have deservance issues with having other people do stuff. Uh, there is uh, this great line, I interviewed a guy when I was a carpet cleaner, and I was just starting to teach carpet cleaners marketing, and he, his name was Jim Henry, and it was 21 ideas on hiring and firing, and he said, you don't buy a dog and bark for it. <laughs> And I was like, that's a very interesting line. Yeah. You don't, you don't die. And, and how often as, as entrepreneurs do we, quote unquote, buy dogs and bark for them, right? And that's a really hard thing. It's been hard in my life to let go of stuff. I, uh, you know, I certainly have a team, I have a great team. I certainly have invested a lot. And part of my agenda here, and in, in even with, with, with you, is because you're really good and you've coached a lot of people on how to do this, 
and I don't think it was very easy for you in the beginning, but you've learned how to do that. And I'd like to be able to have you to, to go back to transfer, yeah. to transfer what you learned, because I'd love to have everyone leave this conversation with a lot more leverage. Yeah, let me, let, you guys want some very tactical ways to work through people? So, so here's the, the, the big idea, is that at each stage of revenue, usually 300K, 2 million, 10 million, 30 million, 100 million, there's different skills the CEO, like there's one skill the CEO absolutely need to adopt or they'll never be able to get to the next one. And I'm assuming most of this room kind of like seven figures, couple seven, you know oh, what yeah. I mean? There's, not, there's no one in here that has a company that's doing less than a million and there's, uh, right. there's at least 15 people that have a hundred million dollar plus company. Well, the cool part is, is this strategy works at all levels, but predominantly for the two million level, two, plus or minus 500K, it's, it's because at that that level, the skill to learn is how to work through somebody. And that is a scary proposition, especially if you are the product, you are the business, your name's out there, and you're asking somebody else to lead a team that then talks to the customer. So that's where you would easily want to, you know, buy a dog and then bark for it. What I'm gonna encourage you to do is a few things. Number one is empower your frontline workers to fix problems. So one of my favorite strategies I talk about in the book yeah. um, is the $50 magic pill. Sometimes I call it the 50 to fix it. But essentially, um, anybody on my team can spend up to $50 to solve any problem they, they deem worthy without ever asking for permission. Okay. Now that sounds cool, you probably heard it before, but let me show you how it scales up. And I don't talk about this in the book, so I want to bring stuff for Joe specifically. It's 50 for frontline workers, 500 for managers, 5,000 for directors, and 50,000 for C-level. Now think about that. So I literally empower my team at different levels to spend real dollars without ever asking for permission to solve problems. The only thing I ask them is after they solve it that they tell their leader. So if one of my managers spends $5,000 to solve a problem, all I ask them is spend it, solve it, get it done, but then you have to tell your leader so that there's an opportunity to have a feedback loop. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Same thing with C-level. So that's how I'm able to scale companies is because I empower the people to make decisions to solve problems. So first off, figure out what you feel comfortable with and then literally have an all hands and tell your teams, if you see a problem, now I love it because Sam's here and Sam's the one that caused this little kerfuffle in the business. Um, <laughs> Sam was earlier on in our relationship, he's one of my business partners now, but he was one of our um, editors on our YouTube channel and we had this rule. So he had an issue with a thumbnail. So he needed a thumbnail and the designer on the team didn't get back to him. So what does Sam do? Hires a freelance thumbnail designer. And the video comes out, thumbnails goes out, the designer goes, I didn't design that, who designed that? Well, Sam hired somebody. Why are you guys hiring people to do my job? See what happens there? Now, our leaders are well trained to have a conversation to say, if Sam felt like he wasn't getting the response time fast enough, then there's an issue with process. But the issue with process shouldn't stop because we're waiting on somebody. It's, hey, if that hurts your feelings, let's talk about why he didn't get what he needed by the certain time. See what I'm saying? So it, it, it will uncover opportunities for you to hopefully develop your people. <laughs> I, I like that the very nice way to say that. Or I, I, someone's I just to. a total slug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Or somebody yeah. can't manage themselves and you might have to transition them off or AK fire them. So uh, that's one of my favorite things. But the other one is the 131 rule. Okay, so the 131 rule states this, is that anybody that comes to you with a problem, you ask them, what is the problem we're trying to solve? That is one of my favorite questions to ask in the universe of history of questions. If you come to me and you ask me for advice, first question I'm gonna ask you is, what problem are you trying to solve? I don't know if you've ever been down the rabbit hole of answering somebody's question to find out at the end of your answer, they were like, oh no, you didn't understand me. And you're like, oh, you didn't ask that question. What are you talking about? And it's like, okay, reset. So step one, what problem are you trying to solve? Then the, the three part of the equation is what are the three uh, options you've evaluated. Because as entrepreneurs, what we actually want from other people is that they've thought through the option set the way we would. Because like that's the thing, when I talk to somebody I feel like they don't get it, it's because I don't think you evaluated all the options. Mm -hmm. So I always ask people, what are your three options that you've evaluated? And then the last one is, what's your one recommendation? So if you came to me and said, uh, hey Joe, we need to fill this room, we don't have enough people, mm -hmm. I'd say, what's your one, three, one? I don't know, I don't run marketing. I know, but you own this room. You, you lead this area of the business. Well, I don't know. Well, do you need some time to go think about it? I literally ask them, how much time do you need to go come up with some options? And, and if they don't even know where to start, I say, well, who could you tell me that you would consider calling to get some feedback on coming up with those options? And they go, oh, I get it now. Okay, perfect. 
So it's like one time I had an HR guy, Adam, and he came to me and he's like, dude, I'm stressed out. I said, why? He goes, we gotta hire 12 people in the next month. I said, cool. Well, I'm stressed out. I can hear it in your voice. He's like, what are you gonna do about it? I don't know. <laughs> You're the HR person. <laughs> like, why is it my job? I think I hired you to do your job. I'm just not gonna bark for you. And he's like, well, I've never done this before. I go, hey, guess what? Nobody on the team's done what we're doing right now. We're growing really fast. We all got to learn really fast. So I said, what's your one, three, one? He's like, dude, I don't have time for this shit. I get that you think it's shit, but for me, this is how I'm going to lead you properly. And the way I show up for you is how you're going to show up for your team. And if I don't teach you this, you're going to be the bottleneck. And I was like, how much time do you need to figure it out? He said, give me a day. I said, tomorrow, same time, four o'clock. He's like, yep, yeah, cool. Next morning, 10 a.m., text me, I'm good. He didn't need, he didn't need me because once he started looking at it, he solved the problem. And what happens is when you hold yourself accountable to that process is that you will eventually wake up one day and have an organization where you are not needed. Now, that brings up some feelings. Mm -hmm. So all you guys want to be really important. I know, I can fucking, this, especially this group, like trust me, I talk to <laughs> software CEOs, different than people where they are the person in the business. We like to feel needed. But I'll tell you, if you want the freedom that I talk about in this book, a third of the problem is leadership. It's how you're showing up as a leader in your team. And the one three, one rule will literally allow you to build a business that grows on its own. My philosophy is simple. I build the people, the people build the business. Yeah, that's great, that's great. So uh, email is one of the most horrifying, scary things of my entire existence. No, well, it, not, it's not that bad, but it, it, it annoys me. And, and you have a great way of uh, outsourcing all of it and and I have a friend which I won't even mention you probably, you probably know him uh, but he's built a billion dollar company he has a thousand employees uh, he has an autoresponder that basically says you know I'm not able to get back to most emails I may or I may not and and in spite of how much you preach this uh, most people don't do it and now I am uh, more intent on figuring this this process out and there's always an excuse we were talking earlier about alibis you know we all have, one of my alibis is i deal with a lot of high profile people okay. in, in the area of addiction recovery and i don't want any e an email coming that anyone's going to read so i'm very protective of even eunice who's been my assistant for 28 years who i trust with everything uh, I don't, she doesn't read my emails directly. Now we have different emails that come to me that go to team, uh, but I have this private email box that no one gets to and it, and I can't keep up with it, never been able to. And part of it, I'm like, you know, I'm talking to Dan Martell, he's probably the best guy that I could, <laughs> that could ever lay this out. And once and for all, I can handle this shit and just freaking take it, it. That's been one of my, like, why have I not done this? It's, mm. it's wasted so much of my time. Um, so how do you, how do you, cause you, you, you route all your messages, not just email. I don't, but I don't do email. Yeah. I don't do email. Ends there, she can tell you I don't do email. Yeah. I don't do text messages, honestly. Joe probably gets annoyed with me because he messaged me. I don't reply to him sometimes. Eventually I get to it, but it's, I just don't. One thing about me is I turn off all notifications on my phone and I consume the things like TikTok when I want to, right? Now, here's what I would ask you, Joe, to consider is like, because change is hard. Does that, does that make sense? Everybody like, change is like scary. And we won't change unless one or two things is the, the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. And what I would assume, Joe, is the pain isn't that painful yet, because if it was, you would have made the change. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and also, like, it, it's weird, because you know, I'm a relationship guy, yeah. so I know what to do with messages, yep. and, and, and I have yet to figure out how, I think about 10% of what we do is magic, 90% of it can be taught to other people. So that 10% of me that's magic, I don't know how to teach that yeah. to other people, but I can teach a lot of yeah. other stuff to, to people. So yeah. So in the book, I have this framework called the 10-80-10 rule, which is all about the magic. It's the mm -hmm. first 10%. Steve Jobs goes down with Johnny Ives in his studio, and they talk about iMacs and iPods and iPhones, right? And then Johnny Ives takes all those crazy ideas from Steve Jobs and talks to his production folks and prototypers, and they, you know, they do shit, and then they come back and they go, "Hey, Steve, look at look at the thing we built," and he's like, "Okay," and his last 10% is. Let's tweak it, and then I'm going to present it to the world. That's his, that's his genius, that's his happy place, that's his magic. So I, I totally get that, and I'm the same way. I just don't do that 80%. Yeah. So first off, if 
if you have this like belief that there's no way in the history of the world that anybody else could ever read this before me, then I can't help because that would be required. Now, when I say that out loud, and some of you guys, not Joe, but you might be in the same position, I would just encourage you to consider that there are incredible people out there that could give two shits less about who you're friends with, what you do, your personal affairs, and they just wanna help you. And if you empower them to do that, like for me, Ann, and Ann has an assistant, we have a team, but she manages that communication, then you can just defer it. And when I hire an assistant, I have a very clear uh, conversation with them. Everything I do and you see is considered private. Do not put me in an awkward position to have to let you go because you were at a party at a friend's house that heard you work for me and you accidentally shared with them something that nobody should have known. Even if it's my schedule. Just take it, like, pretend like you don't know me and that's probably a good place to stay. Because you will see stuff, dude, I do, inve I, I do investments in publicly traded companies. It's very illegal. Like, it's insider trading. So I, I totally get And I have those same emails from people who are struggling with addiction, et cetera. I just, like, at minimum, if I want to solve the problem, then somebody else has to be able to review those messages yeah. and then sort them. I get to still do my magic. I just, I'm just not in there. So then mm -hmm. once a day, literally before this meeting, we're driving from a previous podcast, we're sitting in the, in the, the SUV, and Anne's got my review folder open, and she's saying, boom, boom, boom. I mean, we did an investment, we did a ton of shit in the car. And I get to come here, hang out, and do lunch with Joe. I don't even think about my inbox. So like some of you guys I've actually met, I just forget because literally Ann is routing so much stuff, and I would love to, but I'm more of a person. I like, I like hanging out with people, and that's where my magic is. It ain't my inbox. So if you want to know if I'm free next, next Thursday for your podcast, I'm the last person you should ask. Like, Tommy, you're asking me where I'm staying. I literally don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's not Tempe. Sam doesn't even know because Ann takes care of us and we have Ubers and we drive, you know what I mean? So like, I just, a long time ago, I realized there's a lot of, like for you to be able to scale, you have to be okay not knowing. Do you know how crazy it is for my dad? My dad goes, hey Dan, when's your next event? It's in Scottsdale next week. Cool, how many people are coming? I don't know. How do you not know? Why is it my job to know? Well, what if nobody shows up? Well, dad, good news. If, uh, if nobody's showing up, the team will tell me. <laughs> but the fact that they haven't told me tells me people are showing up, so I'm still going. I don't get it. What do you not get? Well, don't you care? I care a lot about other stuff, not necessarily how many people are coming to the event, because I'm gonna be on stage doing what I do regardless if there's four people. And the team actually has red, green, yellow, and you gotta build a system. And I think that's like a big thing is, if the pain is hard enough for you wanna solve it, trust me, there is a solution. It's gonna take process, it's gonna take thinking. But again, when I talked about skills, beliefs, and character traits, you're gonna to have to go through the process of developing the skills to let it go. But I'll tell you, man, the day that you wake up and you don't do email, and you were there with your kids, or present with a friend, or you didn't come back from a vacation and you're totally stressed out day one because you got an inbox full of messages, mm -hmm. Wow, you wanna talk about creativity and freedom and the ability to just push and drive as hard as you can with no pain line? It is a magical place. And that's, that, literally that's the movement I'm trying to create is I wanna teach people how to build businesses they don't grow to hate. Cause it ain't the business that they're in, it's how they designed it and they get to a place where it sucks. I'm not saying, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but that's yeah. literally, when people shut down a business it's because they built it wrong and the way they're doing it, it hurts. And the, the process I teach, literally from a dollar to ROI point of view, you can't deny it. it's a math equation, right? So that's, that's why I'm like really passionate about this message. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. Well, and, and by the way, what I'm doing here is a bit of a setup because when I uh, decided I was going to take a one-year sabbatical in 2021, in 2020, I was like thinking, okay, in order to have the conditions of taking an entire year off, I have to set it up. So in order to not have email, I have to set it up. So right now I'm going through the setup process, but I, I thought about it, I had a few conversations, am I really gonna do this? And then I decided to publicly announce it and I did an interview Are we with, doing this? Oh well, no, I did it in 2021, but we're oh, doing this. No, no, no that's what I'm saying. Is You're committing to getting rid of your thing. inbox, yeah. Eunice, are you hearing it? Yeah, and, and so I'm looking because, at her face because I've had, do you, you believe them though? 
Uh, do you believe me? Uh, there we go. Yeah. Here, here's what I'm going to do for Joe. Is Anne, I'm putting you on the spot, Anne is your resource a thousand percent. Everything I have, you can ask Anne. She will teach you how we do it, the process. So you've mm -hmm. got the best in the world trained. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To support you. I love it. No, I appreciate that. And by the way, I'm doing this for me because I want to. Totally. You know, what, totally what's in it for me. That's my new book, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and yeah. secondly, I have had conversations with at least 10 people in, that are in this room over the years that in the same boat. They're in the same boat as me, and I want this to be for everyone here, too, that struggles with it. Can, you know? can I just ask a question? How many of you guys, even if Inbox wasn't in your life, most people text you anyways? How many of you guys have that problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Here's what I do. So Joe texts me and he's like, hey man, let's get together for this thing on this day, blah, blah, blah. I screenshot it and I send it to Ann. I literally do this all day long. I screenshot, start a new text thread, put Ann in the person in charge, paste it in so I don't have to write anything. And Ann knows, got it. It will change the game for you. Why is that powerful? You just started teaching people who really knows what's going on in your life. Okay, and over time you will teach people how to treat you. So I want people to call me when they're in need and they need Dan Martell conversation. But if you need me to do something or you need my bio or you need to know if I'm available on a certain date, I don't even know. So don't ask me, but I'll introduce you to the person that does. Mm -hmm. So, and there's ways to build the tools, even the software, because some people are like, well, what if Ann goes somewhere else and all of a sudden the phone number, you can get a global phone number that anybody on the back end can get access to. Like these are problems that can be solved. I just, I don't even want to talk about that because I want you to just make a commitment like Joe just did to give it the fuck up. Like just to make today the day, I'm done. Email doesn't support me. If I could get those two hours a day back, what would I do with that? Hopefully you'd go to the gym and spend time with people you love because that's a probably a really good investment. Mm -hmm. And buy back your time. Yeah, love it. All right, so what are the creative ways that you preload your year to get the most out of it for? Uh yeah. It's, a, it's a great question. So I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to like doing as much as I can in a period of time. Uh, and I do it because obviously I teach it to people. So it's like, I don't know if you like, they always say like, if you want to get wealthy, help other people get wealthy. Mm -hmm. So it's like, because I'm teaching other people how to get more time back to live a pretty high quality life, it's kind of fun because then I keep asking myself, like, how do I do it even better? So my wife and my friends are all like, this is great, Dan. You have so much time for us because I teach it. So I have to do it. But what I have is a process for essentially designing my year, okay? So the first step is, at the end of last year in December, I review everything I, did, I do with my wife, like everything that happened in the previous year, my wife and I do a retreat and we look at it and we ask ourselves, fuck yeah or never again. And it's literally that simple. If it's not a fuck yeah, we just, we won't do it again. And I'm talking like family trips, blah, blah. We just, we just decided, uh, I'll tell you, you guys, we used to go home, because I, I grew up on the East Coast, live on the West Coast, we used to go to the East Coast every summer for two weeks. This trip, we decided, ain't a fuck yeah no more. Mm -hmm. They can come to us, and I'll pay for it. And I think you guys should give yourselves permission to do that stuff. Some of you guys are holding on to stuff, you need to create some space. It's not what you're doing, it's what you gotta stop doing, okay? So like, we look at all that, then we look at all the requests of things we wanna do, look at our bucket list stuff, look at, you know, we made a commitment that like every two years we do like this big family trip with all our families, her family one year, the other year my family, two countries a year with our kids, all that stuff, and then we have this one page document that I'll give you, it's literally a template, and it's got all the months, like days, and we take the list and we put it into the calendar, visually. I use my pen on my iPad. And I highlight, and we have different color codes. So like red is Renee and I time. My wife, Renee. And then like orange is work. And, and green is like my boys trips and like all that stuff. And then we kind of look at it like a piece of art and ask ourselves, does this feel good? If we actually did this this year, would it feel good? And then we, we have the feedback. So like, I remember one year I used to do my vacations before my events. I don't know, how many of you guys run events? Show of hands. Okay, imagine going on vacation before your event. 
Dumbest idea ever. Never occurred to me to sit down and ask myself, does that feel good? So when we were looking at it, I was like, hmm, let's move it after. That's all I did. I, I, and then, wow, what a crazy idea. Now I go on vacation after my event. So literally after this event, I'm on vacation and I am so present. The team is happy. The customers are filled up. Like I'm good to go. So it's like all these little tweaks that I do. Um, other things that I do to preload my year, I put all my like business building stuff in there. So I put all my quarterly strategic plannings with my the, the key people on my teams. Um, I put all my events in there. I put I put my, my the things I need to do to recharge, right? So if anybody follows me on social, I do snowboard trip, snow biking trip, mountain bike trip, and they're all spaced out throughout the year. Um, and literally if, and I'm not even joking, if today was my last day, obviously I'd miss my kids and I love my wife, but that would, that would be the hardest thing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm good. And I've been good for a really long time. It's a regret minimization strategy. For a long time, I've said, if today was my last day, would I be okay with it? And a long time, I couldn't say yes. But now, because I know that I've done the time with my kids, spent time with my family, spent time with my teams, you know what I mean? Like, and I just think being a little bit more intentional with a cool tool, like the preloaded year, it just changes the game for your ability to get the most out of a 12 month period. So what was present when you wasn't working uh, that caused it to not work uh, other than alcohol? Yeah. No, alcohol was a big one. So I quit drinking 11 years ago, best decision I ever made in my life. I get emotional because I think of my boys. I grew up around it. We grew, like, I mean, I knew better. Dan, you should not drink. Oh no, it's okay. I'll I'll be a social drinker and fuck. If I was drinking, I wouldn't be with my wife and my kids would have to experience a lot of chaos. So I'm just like super grateful that God said stop. Like, and um, so that was a big thing. But honestly, it was all the last minute reschedules. The oh, I forgot to do this with this person. Like, there's all these feedback loops that happen in our lives that should indicate to us that we're missing the mark a little bit. And it doesn't take a lot of work. I'll tell you a stupid example, but it's, it's, it's representative of this, the issue. Like I have one of my best friends, I love him, okay? He read the book, said he read the book. I can tell you didn't really read, you know what I mean? Like some people read books, I don't think you really, you didn't. And like, we'll go and do something and he'll forget a thing. And I'm like, dude, this is not the first time you forgot your thing to do the thing. And like, he'll have to drive 45 minutes back home to get it. I was like, why don't you have a checklist? And like, I know some of you guys are like, I don't want a checklist, cool. Well then just be okay that you'll always forget a thing. I have a checklist. It doesn't take a little bit of planning to write down, like if Joe says, hey, I want you to do this. I say, and add it to our travel schedule. And we have like a meeting where we review stuff and we evaluate, you know what I mean? Like it takes a little bit of planning, but because I do that, I don't have those conversations. Like, oh shit, it was my dad's birthday yesterday. Fuck, I'm an asshole. I should, if I knew that, I would have planned, I would have went home, I would, you know what I mean? So like, for me, it's all the times that I missed something, I wasn't on top of it, uh, that was the feedback loop to say, hey, if you just planned a little bit, was a little bit more disciplined, because that's a big character trait I think most people are having a hard time with, is they make commitments to themselves in private that they don't keep. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's two problems. This, this book's gonna surface two things for people. One is that you'll never earn a penny more than you think you deserve. So the buying back of your time, it's not that you can't afford it, is you don't think you deserve it. And that's not something I can help out in 45 minutes on stage. The second one is that you lack confidence in your ability to figure it out. And the reason you lack confidence is because you don't keep the commitments you make to yourself in private. And you erode that. So until you upgrade your self-worth so that you realize your time is worth triple what you're saying it's worth, and you hold the commitments that you make to yourself in private, discipline, then it's gonna be really hard for you to justify buying back your time. Yeah. So that psychological issue of uh, 
not thinking you deserve it, what needed to happen in your life in order for you to get to that place? I think there's levels, right? It's like, do I feel like I deserve to be, like, do I, I mean, it, literally when I think back and I skin, like, when I was, you know, 26, after 10 years of being an entrepreneur, I was like, do I, do I deserve to be a millionaire? Like, really, like, people say, you write it down, fucking, you know, goals, you know, you read all the books, and like, what, you know, you write, you write it all down, but as you write it, you don't believe it. Like, that's just true. I can really, I can remember, I went to a seminar and I wrote down the goal and I will be a millionaire, but I'm like, will I really? You know what I mean? Like, like I don't know, I'm not like good and like, okay, I'll write it down, I'll play along, I'll visualize it. So there was like these levels of like, okay, I did it. So it's, it's sometimes I wonder which comes first, right? Is it the, well, I know which comes first, is it's the, the person who does the thing that gets the result. So at different levels, what I've changed, and this will probably serve a lot of people because I don't talk about this in the book at all, is whatever my goal is, whatever the self, like whatever the number is, the outcome I want to do, the achievement, I don't focus on just writing that down and hold it in my mind, although I do. I'm a big visualization, manifestation, energy guy. Like, like bigger than most people know. If you ask me, I'll tell you all about it. But what I do now is I ask myself, what's the daily standard that I would have to uphold to make that true? Mm -hmm. And that's where I've really learned to build my self-confidence and my self-worth. Is my self-worth is not tied to the achievement, my self-worth is tied to the activity. And Naval actually said this to me a long time ago. He said, be patient with results and impatient with action. Be patient with results, impatient with action. Which means that if I want to build a 10 million a year business, cool, what would need to be true on a daily, weekly basis in my schedule? Because mm -hmm. really, I can tell you what's important to you. Right? If I ask you guys, how many is family really important to you? Raise your hands. Uh, I, I don't mean to put you guys under the bus, but here, check this out. If I looked at your bank account and I looked at your spending, would I see family on there disproportionate to what you just said, which is number one? And if I looked at your calendar, would I see that stuff in there as well, disproportionate to what you said? Because those are just those are just realities. Where do you invest? So like, I have a family coach. I have a parent coach. Like, why do we invest in Genius Network? And for some of you guys, never even considered inviting somebody to coach you as a family unit, right? They exist. We live in this cool. I think it's the coolest thing in the world. There's and Joe, you know them all. Like, there's literally an expert in anything you could ever want to do, including gifting. Shout out to John, right? Like anything that you aspire to be, there's a person that will coach you and you can just pay them. Just, again, then there's somebody that's going to teach you how to outsource and delegate and you don't even have to, like it's not me, you can just hire them and do it. And, and there's some people, they just, for the life of them, they want everyone else to pay them, but they don't want to pay for anything. Those I, people have a fucking problem. Oh, yeah. Okay, I don't know, I, they're not in this room, but let's say they're out there. Yeah. You, how you show up as a buyer is how your customers will show up for you. And if you're struggling in your business, it's because you're putting out shitty energy. Yeah. The amount of people we talk to that will not invest in themselves, but yet charge a premium for people to invest in them, is fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah, completely. There's so many people that are the pontificators of self-help that are too cool for school. They only show up if they're on stage, but they won't learn. And you know what? I, I say this a lot, and I've I've I've, I've thought of this a lot because I started my first podcast in. 2010. The first time I ever recorded a podcast oh, was 2005, yeah. when no one even knew what they were, and it yeah. was a podcast on promoting one they of our. They didn't call them podcasts then. Uh, well, they had just started. Apple had just started. Yeah. But okay, this is Apple. Like literally, the first okay. time podcast came out. So we used it as a promotion for um, our our carpet cleaning super conference. That was in 2005. Then I started I Love Marketing in 2010, and uh, you know, such a new thing, and. It's amazing because I had been doing interviews since 1997, and so I've interviewed over you know a thousand people for an hour to 90 minutes uh, that we've just published. It's wow. probably double that in terms of just if you think interviews I've done at Genius Network and stuff. Yeah, but so it's a lot of stuff. And what I you know and along the way, you know, working on my recovery, having all kinds of just challenges throughout you know a couple decades of my life and uh, spent over half a million dollars on recovery and I spent that much you know acting out addictively too <laughs> so yeah. so it's kind of a well, no, quick. Yeah. I, I didn't calculate every aspect of it but it was a lot and so I did a lot of therapy and I did I've done a lot of work and you know everything from you know plant medicines to you name it and uh, 
what, what, I, le what I learned now today is that many of the people, uh, men and women, but a lot of my male friends that are not willing to do the work or go and get real help, mm. what they do instead for is they start a podcast and uh it's like free therapy <laughs> yeah exactly and they yeah. interview everyone and everyone thinks they have their fucking shit together but if you actually say have you ever done any real fucking work have you ever <laughs> no you know and and so they do surface stuff and i'm look everyone's got their own journey i mean i'm like whatever it's you know it's it, it, people do what they do uh it's it's just there's there's something about you know, you know, walking the walk and talking the talk. Uh, the, the, one of the um, Joey who gave you a testimonial uh, on on your book, Coleman. Yeah, yeah, his book's great. Oh, yeah, yeah, his new one and his previous one. Yeah. And uh, uh, I met him, uh, Michael Fishman, who I think is downstairs. Had him speak at his Consumer Health Summit, and uh, he said, I, I think it's him, or I'm, I'm not sure who, where, or maybe it's Garrett. Wait, Gunderson. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, yeah he's, he's also on buddy. There. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's Garrett. Okay, those who say, though they say those who can't do teach, but not here. Dan did it, then masterfully taught it. A book on living a life you don't want to retire from and how to live uh, your retirement dream today. So I've, kn I've known Garrett for close to 20 years, and uh, but it's true though. Those that can't teach, there's there's a lot to be said about people that are out there doing it, and I I think you know I, I like it when someone's a convert of their own system. I think there's a different result when you actually ha walk the path and you figure out how to do it and then you're able to transfer that to other people. And I think, you know, you're, you're, it, and here's the thing on, on his book. Oftentimes I'll buy books for everybody in Genius Network. I mean, they, they invest a lot of money in this. It's, you know, it's not that big of a deal to, to, to buy a book. What I'd like to do with this one and what I'd like to do with John, who I'm going to interview tomorrow, is I want you to buy the book. This is also an audio. If you prefer audio, buy the book. And then and, and if you just read the book and just send me, um, like, literally an insight, you can email it to uh, Eunice at JoePolish.com. <laughs> And, and just like, here's the big aha and the big insight that I got out of it. For one, I'd love to share that with Dan. I'd love for him to see what everyone's yeah. perspective. I want you to, up to your own fruition, go and buy the book and share that. And then I will make a donation to Genius Recovery in your name uh, as a result of it for the cost of the book. Uh, just because I want everyone to do it. I, I, I just don't want to give this book out and say, yeah, go, go read. Because I know all of you probably buy books at 10 times the speed of your rate of ingesting in, in them. And some of you, it's, you know, so, but this one really is a good roadmap. And I, and I think you'll you'll learn a lot. So, uh, and and I think we can have a future discussion on this too because it's it's really important. But the foundational stuff of uh, that that Dan teaches uh, is is great, especially for highly successful entrepreneurs, which all of you are. Uh, so my my other question is why most CEOs hire COOs instead of uh, assistants? Uh, you know, because I'll tell how many of you have an assistant. Okay. How many of you do not have an assistant? Yeah. Okay, and I, I kind of set that up there, like, good afraid to like, raise yeah. your hand. Uh, how many of you have a CEO or a COO? Okay, <laughs> keep your hand raised if you also have an assistant, too. Okay, so a couple hands went down. Okay, so why is that? Because it is true. Yeah, I thought you were going to ask how many people wouldn't raise their hand no matter how many times you asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I've seen that. You know, video. actually, I know, that's right. I saw it last night. Um, here, here's. Here's what I've discovered, right? And there's some great people that have written some great frameworks and great books that we've all, we know the people, we've read the books. You know what I'm talking about? Like the business books, the, the ones how to operate your business and they tell you, you hire somebody to help you in this area and then you're, you know, life is magical. The challenge <laughs> for most entrepreneurs is you need to learn how to collaborate with those people. It's a skill. And if you don't learn it, it doesn't work out. So I can tell you, there are a lot of people that hire a COO and six months later, nine months later, 12 months later, they fire them. And it just didn't work and they blame the person. And that person had a pedigree and they came with playbooks and they wanted to help the CEO, but there was the way that the CEO collaborated with them just didn't work out. I, I literally coached those types of CEOs and oftentimes it's, they didn't hire the wrong person, is they didn't understand how to have, have a partner, right? So the reason why, if you look at, in chapter five, it's called the replacement ladder, okay? And I teach the hires in sequence you should make that are the least amount of investment cost for the biggest ROI on time. 
and the COO would be at the top. So there's four others, but the bottom one is the assistant. And the reason why is because when you're trying to learn how to collaborate with a partner that has intimate knowledge about your schedule and your calendar and, all, and your email and your relationships, you're better off starting at the bottom where the stakes are low. Does that make sense? Like you gotta learn, so it's like, hey, if I'm gonna learn how to tightrope or slack rope, you see these kids in parks and they're fucking flips and jumping, like they're not doing that over the Grand Canyon. They're starting on the grass. And I would encourage you to consider, if you have, many people have assistants, but like there's different levels, okay? So let me just share. A virtual assistant that you just CC in your emails to do stuff for you, or even an executive assistant, and you just CC them, that's not what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about right there. I love that you have that up. It's 100% of your inbox and 100% of your calendar. And when you can get those two things out of your life, you've earned the right, and honestly, financially, it's one of the best investments you can make to then move to the second level. And that's the delivery or fulfillment side, right? Some of you guys are still coaching, practicing, doing the work, and it's grinding at you. That's why I say, I wanna help people build a business they don't grow to hate. Don't hate your craft. Just figure out how to design it in a way that you enjoy doing it, but don't abandon your customer either. Like they've come to you for an outcome, and what people buy, check this out, write it down. They buy your standards, not you. They buy your standards. You bought Joe's standard for relationship quality, for how he shows up in the world, for what he values. That's, what you, that's why you're in this room. Okay, if you get time with Joe, it's a fucking bonus. But it ain't why you invest it. So people buy your standard, they don't buy your time. So that's why that replacement ladder is such a fundamental process. And don't skip to the top and hire an operations leader when you haven't even figured out how to be a good CEO. You haven't even been a good collaborator. Because I'll tell you what's gonna happen. You get top heavy, it's like the deck of cards. You hire a head, you pay 200, 300. I mean, the other day I tweeted, it went viral. I said, you can't, you can't pay somebody 80 grand a year and call them your COO. Some of you guys aren't laughing because you might have done that and you're like, well, is that a bad thing? Uh, yeah, it's a bad thing. You do not want somebody who's your COO. Nobody that knows what the fuck they're doing would accept that scenario, okay? So learn with an executive assistant, but really I'm gonna invite you to consider to integrate them into your life. Have them as a business partner, okay? I often call Anne, she's my partner. She's my partner in crime. You know, she knows the family. She's part of my life, just like you. Know, I love when I meet assistants like a Eunice who's been with somebody for so long, because mm -hmm. man, that is rare, okay? But if you find somebody, you have somebody in your life, take care of them, invest in them, because they will literally unlock a level of revenue and opportunity for you that you'll never, ever imagine until you just like, let it go. Yeah, yeah, and that's true. I mean, I, I couldn't have done what I've done without Eunice. Yeah, it would have it, it would it'd be There's no way. There's, yeah, for Thank Eunice. You. Thank you. Yeah. And You've known her since high school, is that correct? Oh, yeah, well, her husband, uh, now husband, uh, in high school, he was uh, one of my best friends. Yeah. He was my best friend, actually, so in cool. high school. And then they, uh, so I've known Eunice before she was even my assistant. So, and that, it was so funny because she, like, so I hire her. Uh, when I was just starting to sell information courses and programs to carpet and upholstery cleaners and you know it's I'm like you know mid 20s and how old was I like 24 I don't know and uh, you know and I've been struggling with this carpet cleaning business and I turned it around and then I started teaching these other systems to other carpet cleaners and I think even before that when I had my carpet cleaning business I think as temporary work, I hired Eunice a couple of times just to answer phone calls, do database entry. I don't even know what it was. Um, so, so I tried that and I'm like, okay, now I have this business and I'm going to start teaching other carpet cleaners how to build and grow their businesses and do what I do in, in this new business. And we ended up building the largest training organization in the world for carpet and upholstery cleaners. I mean, it, totally, it became yeah. a very successful company. Um, but at the first week that she was there, she comes to me and she's like, uh, can we talk? And I'm like, sure. And I had an office in a train caboose uh, in, in in, in Tempe, those of you that are in Tempe, uh, like next to Depot Cantina, which is like the, I, I used to rent a, a train caboose was my office. It was crazy, and it was converted at a bathroom and two desks on it. And so Eunice is in the front, I'm in the back, you know, the executive suite in the back of this caboose. And um, she's like, "Can we talk?" And I'm like, "Sure." She's like, um, "I don't, I, I don't think I can work here anymore." And I'm like, "Well, why?" And she's like, "Well, these." 
people are calling up and they're wanting to buy stuff and I don't want to do sales and I'm like uh, well, what do you mean and she's like well you know I don't want to talk these people into having to buy something so she had this association with sales and in the back of my mind I'm like on I just started this thing. I don't have anyone else right now. I'm like, so you don't want to do sales? And, and she's like, and, and I was in a really good, I, I can't repeat even exactly what I said there, but I, it was one of those channeled moments where I was like, well, Eunice, I mean, what do you mean by sales? Like you have to talk someone into something and, and you help them with, you know, helping them build and grow their business. She's like, uh, yeah, I go, well, you know, everything that you're saying right now is pretty much selling me on the fact that you don't want to do sales. I mean, you are, you're good. You're doing a really good job. I'm almost convinced you don't want to work for me. And she, she's like, well, I don't want to do this job. I go, well, no, I mean, I, you, you got me almost believing that. And so I went this whole riff of like, every, everything you say is either designed to attract or repel someone. I even use that message today when someone, you know, asks about selling. And I go, you're selling me right now. Everything we're doing is going to be sales. It's going to be influence into either direction you want to go or not want to go and for whatever reason I she stayed she she uh, she bought that 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 uh, that inspirational talk and she has now brought in literally tens of millions of dollars into this organization over the years while simultaneously supporting me and our team in, in, a, in a myriad of different ways but yeah uh, one, one of our 100k members Garen he, is it AIO a E I O Eunice. He wants her to write a book called A E I O Eunice <laughs> on how she does what it is she does. Because I've had people over the years that have offered her triple what I pay her uh, in terms of like salary, but she is well taken care of. She believes in what it is we do, and it is like a partnership. Heck yeah. And 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 and, and anyone that works for me, I mean. The, you don't vibe with everyone. Like, not everyone vibes with me. I'm sure I have team members that I drive them bananas and others that they really, you know, jovial, whatever. Uh, but the thing is, like, how do you, what are your criteria for rules of engagement and alignment? Yeah, I mean, the one thing about me is I am 100% okay communicating what do I expect, right? And because of that, like I have preferences. And I think some people that are more on the pushover, I don't think we're on that, like, so there's literally people that will never tell somebody else what they want or need, okay? I'm assuming that's not you. I don't think so. No, no, me and Joe, yeah. we're, we're on the other side. So it's always <laughs> fascinating when I meet these people that are like, yeah, I could never say that. And I'm like, I could never not say that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this beautiful mi middle that'll eventually get there. But what I've discovered with, with team members is you know, any time I've had to let somebody go or they quit, I consider that a feedback loop to me that we did something wrong. 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Either I shouldn't have never let them on the team, so I made a decision that they should, so we gotta fix the recruiting process. Or if they left, they left because we didn't create a future that they could, the, they, they, they didn't see a dream where they could achieve what they wanted within our organization. Now, some people leave and we could have never done that and it's totally fine, but I'm saying anytime somebody leaves or we have to fire them and I didn't want to. So what do I do is in the, in the interview, one of my favorite questions um, to ask is, you know, five years from now, we can't be working together. Describe me your dream life. And here's what I'm looking for. This is my favorite thing. It happens, and Sam, everybody on my team. I'm looking for them describing even with us, us working together, that what they want to create is what I need them to create in my business. Mm -hmm. So when I asked Sam that question, Sam, how old were you when you started working with me? 17. 17. 17. Okay, he's 20, I don't know, you know, 22, something like that. Big kid. Um, you should see his transformation, it's crazy. He was very skinny, didn't, didn't say a word. Like when I say he didn't say a word, Sam didn't talk for the first three years. I didn't even know he had a voice, right? He worked for somebody else on the team. No, well, he says he talks to other people. I never heard it. So, but I remember asking him, like, what's your big vision? And it was like, I want to create a media agency. Like at some point, some day in the future, I want to own my own. Well, fuck, guess what we need? We need a whole media division. Game on, perfect. So that to me is how I find alignment. If I'm hiring a COO, what do you want to do? I want to be the operator of one of the world's largest coaching organizations. That's cool, because I need to build the, you know what I mean? Like I'm always trying to, because here's what I've discovered. If you can find somebody who is, and this is not bad, selfishly directionally aligned with your vision, meaning that their own internal desires is what they want to create and that is what you need, 
you don't have to motivate them. See, some of us have the wrong people on the team or the wrong people in the seat, and we keep having to resell them and resell them and resell them, when the truth is is that what we need them to do and what they want to do is not the same thing. Right. Now, guess what? None of us in this room would put up with that. We would never do something that we don't want to do for a long period of time. You guys get that, right? So why do we ask our teams to do that? So oftentimes, if I ever find in any of my companies that there's somebody that has that situation, I'll work with them to transition them out the company and find somebody that's in because it's better for everybody involved. You can't have a leader that doesn't want to be there that can't show up the way you need them because it's going to stop you and the rest of your team from achieving the goals, which if you don't achieve those goals, your best people are going to leave. Right? When COVID happened, my favorite thing, Dana White, he said to everybody in the UFC, I'm not firing anybody. Nobody's getting laid off. Fuck this. Where do we do it? Guys, stop telling me no. Stop tell I love it. He like literally said, nobody say no to me. We're going to put on a show. How do we do it? And everybody was like, so in just respect that he said, I'm not letting anybody go. We're going to figure this out. And he ends up buying an island, or Dubai gives them an island called Fight Island. And they were the only people, like, you understand, NBA, NFL, you guys all watched it. The world shut down, and UFC says, no, we'll do it. And to me, like, that's like, that's the best. When it, it literally, when you start creating with a team that can show up that way, but you showed up that way first, it feels effortless. Yeah. And that's why, like, for me, the word empire on the cover of my book, you know, my publisher's like, don't call it that. That's too big of a word. Entrepreneurs aren't going to buy the book. I was like, I, it's never happened. My agent said, I literally said, if you don't call it that, I'm going to buy the contract back. My agent's like, what did you say? Nobody's ever said that. I said, I don't care. I, don't, I will buy the contract back. I want to say empire because for me, an empire is a life of unlimited creation you never have to retire from. A life of unlimited creation you never have to retire from. I will always be creating until the last moment I take my breath. I'll be in the fucking in the hospital or wherever I'm going to be, hopefully at home. I'm going to take my last breath, and I will have created that day. That's just what I was born to do. It's what I'm going to do. So, like, to me, I would encourage everybody to consider how do you design your life and a team, you know, that's aligned with what you want to create, and be okay if the people on your team, some of them have to go. Okay, learn. You're responsible. Don't make that mistake again, but then just continuously... Surround yourself with just people that are like, it, it's so much more fun doing it that way, and it's a little bit extra effort, but it's not a lot. Let me, let me just, on that point, because everybody's like, oh, Dan, where did you find this person? This Because anybody that interacts with my team, they're like, man, that person's so great. Eunice is so great. It's like, I don't have a magic pond that I go fishing in for people. I just want you guys to know. There's no like secret fucking recruiting website that I know about that you guys, <laughs> just so you know, doesn't exist. What I'm really good at is understanding what I'm looking for and picking the right people. And then, I always tell people, it's not about making the right decision, it's about making the decision right. I then work with the people to develop the people. So if you're impressed with my team, it's because I'm maniacal about talent acquisition, talent development, and talent retention. And I would argue if you're a CEO at, at two million plus, that is your primary, one of your top three, money, people, and vision. But the people side, it's you got to get world class at talent acquisition, talent development, talent retention. You, you literally, your life will just be magically easier if you just decide to go read John Maxwell, Patrick Lencioni, like talk to the COOs that we've got world class cultures. Figure out what they do. Read the Netflix book. Like if you can do those three things, Think about this, Steve Jobs, this is, most people don't know this. I, I spent a lot of time in the Valley, so we talk a lot about the lures of the people and stuff. Steve Jobs had 50 people in Apple that he identified that every quarter he would go to Half Moon Bay with them. Every quarter, the top 50 you had to be anointed, essentially tap you on the shoulder. It didn't matter if you're a designer, an executive assistant, a manager, marketing director. If you were part of the 50, he'd bring you to Half Moon Bay and him personally, he'd run a mastermind, no different than this. He would teach those people what he knows about business, branding, marketing, engineering, product, everything. He would just pour into those people and have the best people share with the rest of the people. Because his argument was that if I ever have to do this again, these are my 50 people. Mm -hmm. And guess what happened? Mm -hmm. He got kicked out of fucking Apple. <laughs> so he had to do it again with Next. And those were the people. So the way I think about it, and I tell it to my top leaders, my partners all the time, all I need is 50 people. If I have the coolest, smartest, driven, awesomest, growth-minded, fun people, the 50, there's zero project that I want to undertake that I can't do. So just know that if you're ambitious, if you're driven, if you're somebody that wants to create something massive, 
Like it should be a game of pouring into individuals and identifying those key people on your team. It's not for everybody, not everybody wants this. But when you find them, pour into them and trade a future where it's so big, their dreams and goals fit inside of. And the crazy part is when you start talking to them and they have a vision bigger than yours. What do you do then? When they say, hey, you know, Joe, this is cool, but let's go for 100 million. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, whoa, calm down. Eunice, calm down. Why 100? We're good right now. Because Joe, if we don't do 100, I don't feel like I have an opportunity. Fuck, what do I do now? I gotta, like literally this happens to me where people are like, I wanna bring a company public. Well, I didn't wanna bring this company public. All right, let's, you know, wanna buy a company? Like I want, <laughs> I, want you, I want you to stay around me, so like I guess we have to buy a company, you be the CEO and let's bring it public. Like that's literally what your life will turn into at some point, if you, if you desire. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful. So if you wanna get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you wanna watch some more videos that'll be useful and awesome, Click here. Go ahead. You're over here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you. Watch him.